All right, uh, good morning. I'm Dr. Brian Berkey, head of the section of head and neck surgery and oncology at the Cleveland Clinic and secretary of the American Head and Neck Society. It's my great pleasure to introduce our final keynote lecture. Professor Vincent Gregoire obtained his medical degree from the Catholic University of Louvain in Brussels, Belgium in 1987. He was board certified in radiation oncology in Belgium in 1994 and obtained his PhD in radiation biology in 1996 after two fellowships uh, at the Netherlands Cancer Institute in Amsterdam and at MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Professor Gorgois is currently director of the Center for Molecular Imaging and Experimental Radiation Therapy, professor in radiation oncology, and clinical head in the Department of Radiation Oncology at the Academic Hospital uh, of the Catholic University of Louvain. Dr. Gregoire coordinates the head and neck oncology program there, and from there published consensus guidelines for the selection and delineation of radiation target volumes, which brought him worldwide recognition. In addition to his clinical activities, Dr. Gregoire directs a translational research program on tumor microenvironments and the integration of functional and molecular imaging for treatment planning. He is director or co-director of 10 PhD theses uh, and is author or co-author of 195 peer-reviewed publications and 15 book chapters. He has delivered more than 650 abstract presentations, lectures, uh, and teaching seminars worldwide. He is a member of the editorial board of radiation, uh, Radiotherapy and Oncology and is an active member of numerous scientific societies, including ASTRO and ESTRO. He is a past president of ESTRO and the current president of the Belgian Association for Cancer Research. Dr. Gorgois is also vice president of the board of the EORTC and an honorary fellow of the British Royal College of Radiology. His lecture today, which honors the memory of the esteemed Dr. Kian Ang, will discuss personalized treatment in radiation oncology. Please welcome Dr. Vincent Gorgois. This man was an outstanding clinician. He was a great scientist. He was a gentleman. He was my mentor and he became a friend. Mr. Chairman, Dr. Shah, ladies and gentlemen, I'm deeply honored to have the privilege to give this first Kienang award lecture during this IFNOS meeting. I'm deeply honored and I hope I will meet the standard that Kienang always set in his extremely productive career. What I will try to do in the next 20 minutes or so is to review that with you that we, we came a long way as radiation oncologists, as you did as uh, head and neck uh, surgeons, and that obviously we are now paving the way towards treatment individualization, or if you prefer, treatment uh, personalization. And what I will try to do is to briefly review with you the past, the present, and the future. Obviously, not all of you uh, encounter this in before the 50s, I was even not conceived at the time. This is a, a radium therapy unit. Obviously, this is a patient. Uh, there is somewhere over there a tumor which hopefully was adequately clinically staged. I'm not that sure, but I'm not sure exactly what was the target volume. The dose was in organ. It was a dark age of radiation oncology, I have to say. Big improvement came in the, in the 60s with the use of simple X-ray machine. And this simple X-ray machine allowed us to clearly individualize, at least in relation to bony structures, 
where primary tumors were, and thus use this bony anatomy to direct the uh, use of ionizing radiation. But the main improvement came in the 90s, 90s with the availability of 3D conformality, 3D imaging, number one, so that we could indeed image on a 3D basis what we were able to visualize with clinical examination, and we were able, I know this is not Renanek, we were able to delineate on a 3D basis the target volumes, the organic risk, and thus do what we call today a conformal planning, trying to homogenize the dose to the target volumes and decrease the dose as much as possible to the normal tissue at risk. Another quantum leap came in what we are all, all using today, or at least what we sh should all be using today, which is intensity modulated radiation therapy, which is a radiation technique which allows us to further increase the dose gradient between the tumor tissue on one side and the normal tissue on the other side. And this is really what we are all using today on the daily practice. And we can easily conform the radiation dose to a particular target volume. This is a primary tumor. We can give slightly lower dose to what we call the prophylactic target volumes, which is in this case the bilateral uh, lymph nodes level two to four. We can spare some of what we believe are critical organ at risk, oral cavity, parotid gland, spinal cord, in these examples. Of course, all of this needed some learning, needed some integration of uh, various aspects. And one of the first aspects that we did introduce, and in fact we learned it from you, had an exergence, is where are exactly the target volumes? What should be selected depending on the TNM stage? How should we delineate the various target volumes? And we and others, we published some guidelines that were already referred to uh, in, uh, by the nice introduction of the chairman of this session. And so today, as you do selective neck node dissection level two, three, and four, we clearly can do selective neck node irradiation level two, three, and four. Oh, sorry, you mentioned about dissection of the retropharyngeal uh, lymph nodes, we can do it. You mentioned the occipital lymph nodes, we can delineate the occipital lymph nodes. Oh, I'm sorry, it was the buccofacial lymph nodes. These are the buccofacial lymph nodes. Retropharyngeal, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, the lower neck node, the posterior neck, the lateral supraclavicular, the medial supraclavicular, and so on. We obviously learn by discussion with you, by discussion with anatomists, by discussion with imaging people, how to integrate the adequate selection and adequate delineation of target volumes. Does it pay? I think it does. If you look at acute toxicity, acute toxicity mucositis with time during concomitant chemo radiation with the use of IMRT in uh, red in comparison with what we used to do in the past with conformal radiation oncology, and these are Dutch data from Groningen, we, were, or we are able to slightly decrease the acute level of toxicity. But more importantly, we are able to decrease the late effect, or at least some of the late effect, which, and we heard about this in the previous sessions and in other sessions, it's quite important in some of the patients. Subjectively and objectively, this is a, a study from Singapore for naryngeal, uh, sorry, nasopharyngeal squamous cell carcinoma. Subjectively, there is clearly a significant decrease in the xerostomia failing by patients as there is an increase in the saliva output with time after treatment, comparing IMRT and uh, a 2D or 3D conformal radiation. But we learned that xerostomia is good, but it's not enough. We discussed pre in the previous session about swallowing. And indeed, again, from discussion with you and with anatomists, we understood that the dose that we deliver 
to the muscles involved in swallowing the constrictor muscle, mainly the superior constrictor muscles, but also the medial and inferior constrictor muscles. We learned what is the dose which is acceptable by these muscles to keep an adequate swallowing function, and whether we have patients with or without swallowing functions at the time of diagnosis, we can somehow adapt the dose that we can deliver. It's not always easy, it's not always possible. When you have an oropharyngeal, it's quite difficult life to admit to spare the superior pharyngeal muscles. When you have an uh, uh, laryngeal or hypopharyngeal, it's easier to spare the inferior constrictor muscles. But all of this put together obviously will help saving or increasing the uh, swallowing capacity of patients. We also learned over the years to integrate the various imaging modalities, not only the anatomic imaging modalities, and this is uh, a CT, or the MR imaging modalities with various anatomic sequences, but also the uh, molecular imaging modalities on this example uh, using FDG. And we and others, we realized that in fact for a large or for sorry for locally advanced uh, a large T stage we with molecular imaging were slightly closer to the grand truth the uh, uh, anatomic uh, specimen and so we designed uh, prospective studies multicentric prospective studies to show it's not randomized that in fact the integration of molecular imaging modalities in addition to anatomic imaging modalities with CT and MR could give us additional information to better optimally delineate the target volumes, thus do the dose planning, always with the aim of decreasing as much as possible the dose to the organ at risk, giving some late side effects, xerostomia, swallowing difficulties, speech uh, difficulty. And even more, along with all these technical progresses, we learned to work with you, as you hopefully did learn to work with us. And the MTD is the surgeons, the head and neck surgeons, the medical oncologists, the radiation oncologists, and all the other specialists, speech, dietitian, diagnostic radiologists, pathologists, and then based on that, we can agree on guidelines, which indeed we evolved with time, thanks to progresses made in surgery, in surgical procedures, in surgical techniques, as well as in radiation oncology. So I think that we are now in a path which has been quite well discussed, quite well defined, and I guess we know pretty well what is the treatment that we can deliver to what I would like to call the average patient, the one we never see. Because we don't see average patients, isn't it? We see individual patients. And so I think the, the question that we have to ask now, how can we go within this frame, this scope that I just discussed with you, how can we go into more treatment individualization, or if you prefer, treatment personalization. How can we integrate new data, clinical data, imaging data, biological data, to really try to find out this is the optimal treatment modality for Mr. John, and Mrs. Smith will get something slightly different. At least, in two sessions, but maybe it was in three sessions, we already discussed about HPV. And obviously you all know that HPV positive patients are doing much better, especially if they're non-smokers and non-drinkers, than HPV negative patients, especially if they are heavy smokers and heavy drinkers. What should we know today? We don't know. We know there are six or seven ongoing trials on both sides of the oceans that hopefully within the next few years will tell us how to better integrate different radiation oncology approach or those, how to integrate different chemo, more chemo, less chemo, more dose, less dose, more surgery, less surgery. But obviously, 
in the coming few years, we will integrate one of these molecular parameters into the equation, into the paradigm of treatment decision. We will also integrate other more physiological parameters, macro-environmental parameters. We know from the group of, uh, of uh, Jens Overgaard in Aarhus, Denmark, Europe, that hypoxic, and we know it for quite a long time, that hypoxic tumors are doing much worse compared to less hypoxic tumors when it comes to the response to ionizing radiation. It's not new. So why am I telling it? It's not new. In the past, to decide whether a tumor was hypoxic or not, we needed some fancy, quite destructive, um, fine needle measurement of hypoxia. Today, they defined a molecular signature composed of 15 genes, which seems to seg segregate between the less hypoxic tumors and the more hypoxic tumors in terms of outcome after radiation. And in Denmark, it was only simple ionizing radiation without any chemo, either as induction or concomitant. But even more importantly, they realized that if you take the more hypoxic tumor patients and you give them an hypoxic cell sensitizer, in other words, a compound that intrinsically is supposed to only work on those tumors which are less oxygenated. These patients indeed have a 25, 30% increase in outcome. Compared to the ones which are less hypoxic, more favorable prognosis, the use of an hypoxic cell sensitizer obviously doesn't do any additional, uh, uh, doesn't have any additional influence on the outcome. And this led us at the EORTC uh, to, to, to start a multi-institutional, multi-continent trials with Canadians, with Australians, with several European countries, where we will randomize patients with concomitant chemo radiation and nimorazole based on the hypoxic gene profile, having in mind to demonstrate that indeed only those patients who do express a gene signature of hypoxia will hopefully benefit from an hypoxic modification therapy, which is the use of nimorazole in addition to concomitant chemo radiation. But we can go further. I told you that the standard of care is intensity modulated radiation therapy, which means homogeneous dose distribution within the target volumes. But are we sure that we always need to, get, to deliver an homogeneous dose within the target volume? Aren't we sure that, in fact, we should potentially differently paint the dose within the target volume? So in other words, are we sure that we do not to turn around in 360 degrees around this beautiful lady to find out what are the features that could tell us that maybe a slightly different dose needs to be given on the left part or maybe on the right part of the tumor? And instead of a Monet painting, we have a, a molecular imaging painting where you have on an axial slide, sorry, and on a coronal slide, an FDG distribution. And even not being molecular imager, you can, as I can, you can see that those voxels have more FDG uptake compared to this one or even that one. Does it mean something? It may mean that maybe we have more stem cells or maybe higher cell density in those voxels compared to this one. And maybe this should trigger us to give an homogeneous, no, an heterogeneous distribution of the dose with more dose given on this voxel with a high FDG uptake. Can we technically do it easily? We can indeed, with the modern equipment, go up to 86, this is just an example, go up to 86 grays on this small island of cells, keeping the overall dose to the west of the Hananek area and still sparing the oral cavity 
the normal tissue, the constrictor muscles, and the parotid gland. Is this acceptable from a clinical point of view? At least from this phase one study already reported a few years ago, it looks that the acute toxicity is acceptable. Do we know whether this is the way to go? No, yet. Randomized studies have to be initiated, and I'll come back to that later. We can use other tracers, and this is an hypoxic tracer, which on top of the use of molecular drugs modifying the hypoxic content, we may also want to increase the radiation dose to part of the uh, nodal target volume, which did express high hypoxic content. And those could be potentially increased up to whatever grace still to be decided. It's not only molecular imaging with FDG PET or with FASA PET. In the field of uh, diagnostic radiology or molecular diagnostic radiology, diffusion weighted MRI and the group of uh, uh, Leuven in, in Belgium has been pioneer to show that uh, uh, cells, the tumors with, let's call it, less compactness. This is probably the, the better English word that we should use. So in other words, the, the, the tumors that show more free movement of the water, and you can assess this free movement using diffusion weighted MRI, and there was a parameter which is the apparent diffusion coefficient. It shows that we can segregate, segregate sorry, patients with better outcome compared to patients with lower outcome. And so we can imagine a trial where after, let's say, two weeks of concomitant chemo radiation or radiation, we do assess the response using this uh, movement of water. And patients with quite a high movement of water, which means a high delta apparent diffusion coefficient, could be the good responders. We may want to go on with a prescribed dose. The other one, with low delta ADC value may be the one that may require additional dose or maybe a change in treatment paradigm. But with all this data, the clinical data, the imaging data, the molecular data, I mentioned signatures of hypoxia, it's become confusing, at least confusing to simple-minded person like us, radiation oncologists at least, maybe not like you. And so we may, need, we may need some more, we call it data mining uh, uh, essays, procedures, that really try to get from imaging data, from clinical data, from molecular data, plenty of various parameters. It can be the textures, it can be the intensity of a particular contrast agent, it can be the intensity of a particular uh, MRI sequence, it can be the intensity of a particular tracer. It's the relationship between the intensities in tumors and surrounding normal tissues, all of this put using data mining uh, algorithms with the clinical outcome with the molecular um, uh, data could maybe segregate even better those patients in whom we may need some treatment individualization. Is this science fiction? Not really, because quite recently, a group in, in the Netherlands have produced in, in non-small cell lung cancer and had an cancer, some evidence showing that what is called radiomics integration using data mining uh, procedures of huge amount of imaging data. They've shown that some patients could be segregated on as having better outcome after concomitant chemo radiation or radiation alone. Obviously, the integration of these new features into the equation of treatment modality with radiation, concomitant chemo radiation, will be a way to go. 
Is this science fiction? No. We have designed and hopefully will conduct earlier next year a study where patients will be randomized to get either a dose increase using a variation ADC parameters or FASA content, including radiomics to really assess all the features which may be suggestive of bad outcome of patients. This will be a feasibility study that hopefully will translate into a randomized phase three. But there is one last aspect that needs to be discussed, at least when we are radiation oncologists or medical oncologists. I mean, not surgeons. You are used to treat hopefully once. Although I understood that sometimes you do the neck dissection and the, the torse the day after. That's too complex for me to understand why you do so. But we have to do 35 fractions or 30 fractions or sometimes even 40 fractions. So time is an issue. And we see this boat on the River Seine in uh, close to the North Sea. We see the movement. We see the time. And for us, time and movement is something that we have to take into account. Look at these CT, MRI, and FDG PET images before treatment and during concomitant chemo radiation weeks three and week five. So obviously, all what we will be doing in the next year will have to do on top of being molecular driven or molecular imaging driven or molecular genomic driven will have to be, needs to be adaptive. Integrating the time as an important issue in the equation. So ladies and gentlemen, I think we are really in a wonderful time, but also in a challenging point. We are all together giving care to the average patient. We take the clinical examination, we take a biopsy, we take an imaging, we have a TNM stage, a Karnofsky performance status, and then on the MTD, we decide it should be surgery, it could be radiation, it needs to get induction chemo first, followed by. But I think that we are clearly moving towards individualization, personalized care. On top of these classical parameters, we'll clearly integrate a better knowledge of the anatomy, a better knowledge of the functionality, a better knowledge of the protein genomic content. Because at the end of the day, what we are all aiming at is for one particular patient having obviously one particular disease. What we need to do is to individualize the one particular treatment that exactly fits this particular gentleman. This is, in my view, the challenge that all of us in this audience will have to see, to face in the futures. With that, I would like to thank you very much for your kind attention. Um, we're going to give Dr. Gregoire his award. If you would hold on for one second, uh, Dr. Shah and Dr. Yu have some important announcements, but first the award. Uh, Dr. Gregoire, thank you very much for uh, summarizing the current state of the art and for giving some provocative views of the future. We have a plaque and an award to uh, honor you for this, and you certainly uh, honored the memory of Dr. Ang. Thank you.